we're continuing on our study on prayer. We started last week. Last week, we looked at the importance of meditation. Remember that? Meditation is the one of the two parts of prayer. Meditation is the listening part of our prayer or communication with God. That's what we looked at last week. And, and if we are to communicate in a way that would foster a healthy and deep, meaningful relationship with God, then we must first listen to Him in His Word before we pray and speak to God. So that's what we looked at last week, meditation, which is the first part of our prayer. We cannot pray before we meditate on His Word. Otherwise, what are we to pray? We're just going to bring to God a list of grocery lists. You know, this is what we want. Bang, 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 bang. But that's not what prayer is. Prayer is, as we look at briefly last week, it's a communication with God that fosters a relationship. So we must listen before we talk to Him. So today we be, we're going to begin to look at the second part of prayer, that is talking to God, communicating, speaking to God, the speaking part of it, or the church or Christian usually call it prayer to God, the praying bit to God. So I'm not, I don't know you, but if you're like me, you'll find prayer rather difficult compared with the other things in Christian disciplines or, you know, a lot of us prefer to do, we, we don't have problems serving in church, do things, so to speak, for God. But prayer is totally different thing. It's, we find that difficult to sustain a healthy prayer time, regular prayer time with God. So that's, you know, if that's not you, you that's good. But I'm just saying that's, that's me a lot of times. I find praying to be a lot harder than the other disciplines. Like reading the scripture for me, it's a lot easier. Meditating on the word, it's a lot easier. Serving God, loving one another, it's a lot easier than spending time with God in prayer. So, so when it comes to praying, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all can do a lot better. Okay? Uh, so we're going to look at these three things today. Why do we pray? So we're going to go back to the basic. Whom we should be praying to, whom we should pray to, or to whom we should pray. And finally, how should we pray? So we're going to look at the prayer of Jesus today. So why do we pray? There's two quick points. Why do we pray? First one is to know God. We pray because we want to know God. Secondly, to know ourselves. So two reasons we pray. To know God and to know ourselves. To know God. So like any, uh, any, any relationship, really, communication is crucial in order to know one another. You cannot know one another without communication. You can obviously read about someone but that's not knowing that person. That's knowing about the person. And there's a difference. And Tim Keller says this, and I think it's quite striking. He said, on the importance of prayer, he says this, you cannot know God without prayer. Now think about it. That's interesting, isn't it? Tim Keller says, you cannot know God without prayer. Hang on. Can't we read the Bible and know God? Can't we look at, you know, Romans says, can you look at the creation and know God through that? Well, there's a difference, you see. He, and and he, he continued to explain what he means by that when he says you cannot know God without prayer. He says this, there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. To just know about God, know stuff about God, that's one thing. But to know God, to have a personal relationship with God, that can only happen through prayer. So what he's saying is this. When we read the scripture, we may know about God. When you read, see, I, I know a lot of dead people or famous dead people because what I read about them on books. I read about them on biographies. I know about them, but I do not know them. 
And what Tim Keller is saying is there's a huge difference to know about God and to know God. And if we, if we Christians are to know God in a, on a personal level, we must spend time in prayer. So why do we pray? The first reason is to know God. And second reason why we pray is to know ourselves. Um, there's a reason uh, that the world today are seemingly so fragile. The young people, the old people, seems to be so pra- fragile in the sense that when there's a new majority opinion about certain things, social issues, we get sway left and right. Sometimes even Christians do not know where should we stand? What should we believe? The reason is we do not know ourselves. So prayer will help us. The reason we pray, not only to know God, but to know ourselves. Uh, by knowing ourselves, what I mean is to really know who we are in God. And someone, last week we looked at someone, uh, the psalmist says, those who meditate on God's word are not like chaff, that when the wind of suffering comes, when the wind of suffering blows your way, they w- you will not be blown off. So that's what Psalms 1 saying. Those who meditate on God's word will not be like chaff. When the wind comes, you get blown off. Prayer will, why? Because prayer will plant our roots deep by the streams of water. Suffering may come, Different opinions may come, attacks may come our way, people may speak behind our back, but we will not be moved because we are rooted. How are we rooted? Because we know who we are in Christ. We know ourselves. So how do we know ourselves? Through prayer. How do we know God? Through prayer. So secondly, so I'm going to go quickly because I'm going to spend time on third point. Second point, whom we should pray to. Uh, That is a good question. Christians sometimes take this for granted. Who are we praying to when we pray? Uh, What we're going to look at this morning is this, that we, when we pray, as Jesus taught us, is that we are praying to God the Father. Have you ever noticed in um, the interaction between Jesus and the disciples? The disciples never really quite explicitly asked Jesus to teach them on anything. Yes, the disciples ask Jesus for explanations when, th- when they don't understand. But they never quite ask Jesus to teach them on a specific thing, except on prayer. Why? Because prayer is central to Jesus, you see. And the disciples spending time with Jesus day in, day out, see that prayer is important to Jesus. That, you know, it's not an optional activity that Jesus squeeze in. If I have time, I'm going to pray. Or when, when, when my life is tough, I'm going to pray. When there's sickness, I'm going to pray. No, the disciples saw that prayer is central to Jesus' life. That's why if there's one thing that the disciple asked Jesus of to teach them on is how to pray. And that's interesting. Uh, gospel accounts... Um, that Jesus started every day of his life with prayer. He started off with prayer, okay? So it's not an optional thing. He, he would start the day with prayer. He would, and, and in the middle of ministry, in, in the midst of ministry, Jesus would even withdraw himself in the, in the busyness of ministry, withdraw himself, and what did he do? Pray. Uh, that we, we can look at that in uh, Luke 5, for example. Jesus was teaching. There are so many people. He says he withdrew himself and pray. The disciples noticed this, you see, when they spent time with Jesus. What is so special about Jesus? They noticed this, that Jesus takes prayer seriously. So they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Let's look at that in Luke 11, verse 1 to 4. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. 
And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptations. So what we just read there is the famous prayer. All Christians know this. Some of us memorize this. Some of us recite this often. It's known as the Lord's Prayer, or some cultures say it's our Father Prayer. Jesus taught the prayer to the disciples, not so much, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of scholars and theologians believe this as well, not so much that we memorize it and repeat it like a kind of special formula, so to speak. Like if we pray this, we pray the right thing. I don't think that's the aim for us to memorize and pray it repetitively, but rather it's a template for us. It's a model of prayer for us. So that's what we're going to look at this morning on this particular thing. I'm going to look at just the first sentence really on the prayer, Our Father in Heaven. In fact, I'm going to focus on Our Father. Um, so remember, we, I, I don't know whether you remember or not, hope you're not. Uh, I mentioned that we're going to do this in four weeks. I might not be able to because my plan is to split this this the Lord's Prayer in two sermons, but today I'm going to look at Our Father, and there's so much still in it, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, Today we're going to look at Our Father. So a more complete version of this prayer we can read, let's look at together, and that's what we're going to use going forward, Matthew 6, 9 to 13. It says this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It begins with our Father in heaven. How should we pray? Jesus said, pray in this way, our Father in heaven. How do you pray? Well, think about how do you pray. How do you start in your prayer? Most of the time, I start in prayer by saying, Oh God, dear Lord, rarely, I do say it, but rarely I say it, my, my Father or our Father. Usually I say, dear Lord, dear God. But Jesus says this, when you pray, say, our Father who are in heaven. See, the Bible across the Old Testament, New Testament, there are over 100 names of God. There are over 100 names that you can refer God to or as. Yet, when you look at this, the New Testament, when Jesus prayed, he addressed God as Father. Consistently. Let's look at that. When, when Jesus was praying for his friend Lazarus, remember Lazarus, the dead man, his good friend? He was dead for four days, and Jesus prayed for Lazarus, well, to God, for Lazarus, and he says this in John 11, 41, 42. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. How do you say? Father. So when Jesus requests of miracles from God, he says, Father. And another famous prayer of Jesus, known as Jesus' high priestly prayer, Nearing his death, in John 17, 1, 2, Jesus prayed this, Father, the hour has come. He's about to, pers- to be crucified, you see. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, and your Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And again, knowing that he is about to be crucified, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the famous prayer of Jesus, he says this in Matthew 26, 39. My Father, if possible, let this cup pass away. Nevertheless, no as I will, as you will. And on the cross, so leading up to the cross, now on the cross, 
How did Jesus pray in Luke 23, 34? Jesus prayed for those who crucified him, those who nailed him on the cross. He says this, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do. What do we hear? Father, 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 Father. That's how Jesus wants us to pray. Just a little bit of, I understand that not everyone has a positive image of Father. Perhaps that's the reason some of us, when we go to a good God, a sovereign God, we don't pray our Father. Because we think God as a loving God, a sovereign, a powerful God. Yet, our own Father, we're not like that. Our own Father is far from that. So it's hard for us to pray to God as our Father. Perhaps that's the reason. That we can't do it. Our Father on earth falls short. No doubt. Regardless of how good, let's say we, we grew up in a good family, we have a good father. Still, the image of Father, our early Father, falls short of our heavenly Father. So that perhaps may hinder us to pray to God in a way that says, Our Father. But that shouldn't stop us because Jesus taught us when you pray. This is a model for us to follow, you see. He is not just any God. He is our Father. So, finally, I want to spend the rest of our time to look at this third point. How should we pray to the Father? Okay? How we should pray to the Father. So, Jesus to us, when you pray, pray to God in this way. Our Father in heaven. Our prayers, therefore, like this. The image is this a son or a daughter. Regardless how old you are, maybe it's easier if you're younger, but hey, it doesn't matter. You could be 60, 70, 80, 90. Jesus said, when you pray, when you approach God, you can say, Our Father, we approach you as a son and a daughter, approaching a good and loving Father. So, how can we do that? How can we speak to God as our Father? Well, apart from saying our Father, but I don't think that's the point, you see. It's not just about our words saying our Father in heaven. We can say that, but we, we may not understand what it means, and that doesn't affect us. That doesn't help us to know God, that doesn't help us to know ourselves. See, that's the reason, right, when we pray, to know God and to know ourselves. But if we just say our Father, then that's not going to change us. That's not going to change us. That's not what the point is. Because we can say our Father. Anything. So what does it mean? How, how, what are we supposed to do with this knowledge that Jesus tells us to pray to our Father? How can we pray to the Father in a way that is pleasing to God? So let me suggest three ways in this final point. So I'm cheating a bit. I've got multiple points on each of my points, but you know, I've gone through really quickly, haven't I? So I suggest three ways on how we can pray to the Father in a way that is pleasing to Him. First, understanding of our, our past. Secondly, know our identity. And thirdly, approach with confidence. So three things I'm going to look at. Understanding of our past, know our present, our new identity, and approach with confidence. Okay, three ways. First, understanding our past. Before we can appreciate the Father, before we can truly pray our Father in heaven, we need to understand our past. We Christians need to know that only in Christ, through Christ, that we can approach God as our Father. We can't do that in our past life before we know Christ. Do you know that? Not everyone can come to God, the sovereign God, the creator of the universe, the mighty God, and say to me, Oh, Father, you can't do that. You can't go to a famous and big shot person and say, Oh, my daddy, come and say to us. I'm just going to quickly mention in Romans 5, the Bible says we were enemies of God. Enemies of God, not son or daughter. Romans says we were slaves to sin. Enemies, slaves. In Colossians 1 21, it says we were. Alien from God. Stranger.
Jews. God doesn't know us. Alien from God. That's our past. So we can approach our people, pray the Father in a way that is to, to Him, that we understand our past. Secondly, but we also know our new identity, our present. Not only the past, but also the present, our new identity that we have. Let's look at Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive what? Adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, this is Apostle Paul telling you, Christians, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, you are no longer slaves at your past life, but a son. And if a son, then a little heir through God. This is so important. This is our new identity in Christ. This is we, we got a dead set, know and memorize this verse and believe it. That we know the slaves, we know the alien from God, that we know the enemies of God, but we are sons, adopted as sons, an heir through God. We, the, the Greek word of son here, if you translate it, it should be translated as son. Why did I say that? The Greek word here, of this word son, if you translate it into English, it should be translated as son. Huios, son. Male child. Male offspring. Why do I say that? Well, because in some English translations, we use yes, yes means translated as son, but some other translation translated as child. Or even children. Why? Because they want to include. If I say son, that would be seemingly we exclude the daughter, father, and the daughter. Right? But no, the, I think, I believe, the Apostle Paul was intentionally specificating. He, he didn't use his right term, he used son, who he was, for a good reason. When, you see, in, in those days, when, when a rich person has no children of their own and they have lots of properties and wealth, what do they do? They adopt a son. Mm -hmm. No one of those days adopt a daughter. Daughters, no one adopt because they, they can't win. They can't inherit. So if you're a rich person in those days, you know, and you don't have offspring of your own, you say, I better adopt a son so that I can pass on my wealth and inheritance and you can pass on the name of the family. They adopt a son. So that's what happened in, in those days, and, and this is the, so they would adopt a son and a daughter, you see, and this is the incredible truth, it's a radical thinking that Christianity has, that Paul teaches us here, because the Apostle Paul addressed to all Christians, man and woman, he said, you man and woman, not just man, As sons, as someone who will, who will inherit the kingdom. God does not distinguish just because you are male, a man, you are more important in God's eyes than if you are a woman. God says, regardless whether you are man or woman, when the world do not want women, they do not want daughter because daughter cannot inherit, God says, I adopt you. That's why he mentions there, also Paul, if a son is a then an heir through God, someone who inherits that's an heir. And that's remarkable. In the times where women are supposed to stay quiet, stay home, they cannot get education in public with men, this is what, what did Jesus do? This is women sit at his feet to listen to his teaching. And that's right. You see, some, some of uh, our culture is telling us that Christianity is sexist and outdated religion. It put men above women, suppresses women. That's, that's so totally incorrect and accurate. Because Jesus, in his teaching and in his life, he showed that he included women equally. When the culture 
culture of days do not do that. Did not do that. They would exclude one another. The Apostle Paul says this when you address Jesus, teach us to say, Our Father in heaven. The Apostle Paul says this because we can do that because of Christ's identity as an adopted sons. <coughs> so let us not shy away from that translation. You say, Oh man, it says, Son, tell about me, I'm a woman. Well, that's actually a privilege. Because God says, regardless whether you're a man or woman, you will inherit the kingdom. I'll see you in the same way. In my eyes, you are no different. Amen. So that's amazing. So, so do not believe what the culture tells us when they say, you know, you miss a, a bunch of outdated people who believe that men are men tired of positions. No. God just created men and women differently with different functions. But we are equal in God's eyes. So the third thing, so that's the second thing. Know our identity. So our past, our present, and then now, by knowing those two, where we were and where we are, we now can do the third thing. That is to approach God with confidence. So we can approach God in prayer and confidence because it's not just the Lord. We can approach the president of the whatever you name it, country or the Prime Minister of Australia. Anywhere, anytime we want to request things and have access to Him. But God, the universe says we have access to Him, we can have it. We can approach Him with confidence and say, Our Father. Our Father. In fact, what we just read in Galatians, not only do we say Father, what do you say? In a more intimate and deeper sense. Not in the sense that you only call your father father when you are young or little, but even when you could be 80 and you call your father father. It's an intimate word to call someone father. And the Apostle Paul says, we have access to that. Not only that he's a father as a role, but we have that kind of connection. Intimacy with him that we can approach him as our. Therefore, when we pray, when we say, Abba Father, we can approach him with confidence, with a sense of security, not fear, but confidence. And because what we have is unconditional acceptance by God from a loving Father. So, regardless how bad we be, regardless how bad you be, how sinful and how disobedient we be. Because we have access to God in this way, we can always come to Him and say, Our Father. So when we fall away from our belief, when we fall away from God, when we sin so deep and we want to approach God, but too afraid, right? Because we're too shameful. Because we've been seen again and again, we've fallen again and again. We say, I can't approach God. I can't pray to God and ask for forgiveness. This is not the first time I've sinned against God. I've fallen so far away from that. The peace, understanding of our past and our present says to us that we can go back to Him. See, if you are a parent, let me tell you, as a parent, I can tell you, regardless of how bad my son or my daughter has been. If they turn back and they come back to me, I will take them back. And I'm not a perfect dad. I'm not even a perfect dad. I'm not even close in a loving sense to my kids compared to God to us. So God says, if you can do that, how much more I can do it for you. So we can approach him with confidence, regardless of how far we've been away from God. We can go to him. Say, Abba, Father. That, I, I hope you get how important that is to be able to pray to God. God. Not anyone. God. Abba. <coughs> uh, a couple of months ago, 
months ago, I went to, to a movie. I had a date with my little daughter, Teda, to watch a movie called Frozen, number two. Uh, she, she put on her Frozen dress, the blue Frozen dress. And we want to catch a movie and test it. In, in one of the songs, like the first one, the frozen one is Let It Go, right? Remember that one? And the second one, famous songs in the second one is Into the Unknown. Let me read to you, this is interesting, okay? And it's appropriate for us to look at. Let me read to you, I can't sing it, so I'm not even going to try. So just bear with me. Uh, imagine, if you know the song, imagine you can sing along with you. Say, into the unknown, into the unknown, into the unknown home. Oh. I can hear you. This is, this is Elsa saying. I can hear you, but I want. Some will go trouble where others don't. There's a thousand reasons I should go about my day. And I ignore your whispers, which I wish I would go away. Oh, whoa. Well, you are not a voice, you're just a ringing in my ear. And if I hurt you, which I don't, I'm spoken for, I fear. Everyone I've ever loved is here within these walls. I'm sorry, secret sergeant, but I'm blocking out your walls. I've had my adventure. I don't need something new. I'm afraid of what I'm risking if I follow you. So she's hearing this calling voice from the unknown to enter into the unknown. She's refusing. See? Say, now I'm going to block you. All I have here is good. All within this wall, all the people that I love. I don't want to risk it. I don't want to step into the unknown with you. I don't know who you are. Go away. I'm blocking you. And then, of course, into the unknown, into the unknown, oh, into the unknown. Right? And then, what do you want? Because you've been keeping me away. Are you here to distract me so I make a big mistake? Or are you someone out there who's a little bit like me? Who knows deep down I'm not where I meant to be? Every day is a little harder as I feel your power grow. So this voice that's calling her, this unknown voice that's calling her, it's not giving up. Even stronger calling her. Don't you know there's a part of me that longs to go? Oh, she starts to confess that yes, it's this. Little hunger in there, I want to know. Where? Into the unknown. Into the unknown. Into the unknown. And then she says this Are you out there? Do you know me? Can you feel me? Can you show me? Where are you going? Don't leave me alone. How do I follow you? Into the unknown. See, this is Elsa from Frozen. It has this little voice and I'm from an unknown person calling her into the unknown space. And that's our world today. Crying out. <coughs> there will be something that is more than meets the other. There's someone calling us, each and every one of us, not to the unknown as a beauty, but to the known, to the eternity that is known and guaranteed for us. Not only that we are called into something that is known and guaranteed, a beautiful, not scary, but beautiful, secure, known place, the New Jerusalem with God. But Know this. Well, as I do not know who's calling, someone called the unknown calling her. We know who calls us. And it's not just God who calls us, it's all God who calls us. So, how is this even possible? If you've been paying attention, you would have noticed our past is pretty bad. Our past is we are we were enemies of God. We were slaves to sin. We were alien from God. But how in the world that 
we now can have access to God, who are enemies to us, now we can call him our Father. How the heck is that possible? See, this is why the world is telling us that we Christians are crazy, because what we believe is impossible. Well, they are not, in some sense. Then it is crazy, it's hard to believe. It's too good to be true, isn't it? It's like, not buy one get one free, it's like buy one get ten free. Not even that, you don't, you don't have to buy anything. And we receive the offering from enemies or not to become someone who can access to God and call him our. That's too good to be true, almost. So let me tell you how is this even possible for us. Remember how Jesus always addressed, how, how did Jesus always address God? But, right? When you look at that, survey that quickly, when Jesus prayed, he always said, My Father. He always prayed, My Father. When, when I pray, I often say, My God, or Dear Lord. But Jesus, when he prayed, are a hundred names of God. That is in the Bible. Jesus used one name, Father. There's one time he didn't use that name. Jesus didn't call God my Father. When he's Matthew 27, 26, when he was on the cross, notice how Jesus prayed. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, in Arabic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is that a prayer as well. He always addressed God as mm -hmm. our, as our. From the cross, he said, My God, my God. For the first time and for the last time. What happened there? What happened there gives us the answer to the impossible. Why we can be enemies of God in our past life, and now our identity is the precious sons of God. At that moment on the cross, when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, for the very first time, Jesus experiences what it, what it was like to be an enemy of God, what it was like to be alienated from God. For the first time and for the last time, Jesus cried out, My God. See, that's the darkest hour of Jesus' life. Some people say, well, that's crucifixion on the cross was the, the most painful, slow, excruciating death that we see. Yes, perhaps that's true. But the pain wasn't the worst part of Jesus' crucifixion. No, not the pain, not the violence, not the abuse of people on Jesus, not even the shame. Some people say the shame. Can you imagine God, the Father, the King of Kings, came down on earth, stripped naked, and nailed to the cross? Imagine the shame. Yes, but not even that is the darkest hour of Jesus. <coughs> Why? You know what's the darkest hour of Jesus' life? That is to be alienated from God, the Father. He couldn't even say, "My Father." He addressed the Father, who he know from eternity to eternity. Jesus never knew God as someone else. Jesus always knew God from eternity to eternity as God the Father, Abba, loving Father. Then I just got this hour and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's been, he was alienated from God, forsaken by God. The one and only Son of God, forsaken by the Father, alienated by the Father. When God looked upon Jesus on the cross, what did God see? God see him. He didn't see his son. He didn't see Jesus. He see the enemy of God. What, what had just happened there? What had just happened there? Well, let me tell you what happened. On that bloody cross, Jesus bore our sins and took the punishment to his son. On that cross, this is the places with us. We were enemies of God. Now Jesus became enemy of God. 
Jesus was the Son of God. We become sons of God. We saw places with Jesus. That's when the impossible happened. 